live out there? No. Look at me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the October Citizen Involvement Council meeting here at City Hall in the camp council chambers. We were not together in September, so I think we're all going to have to retrain ourselves on how to do this, and we'll just have to bear with each other. For those in my who might be viewing this on television, this <clears throat> this group of, of city volunteers are representatives from each of your neighborhood associations. Each of the neighborhood associations sends two reps, and they come here to talk to the city and the city to us so that we can share what's going on in, <clears throat> in both directions. The first item of business is our roll call by Amy Wilhite. Tony Uzuabunum. Yes, President. <laughs> Michael Berman. Here. Paul Edgar. Here. Amber Holvek. Here. Amy Wilhite. I am here. Kathy Hogan. Here. here. Tom O'Brien is excused. Steve Anderson is excused. Faith Leaf. Alice Watts. Here. Damon Maybe. Present. Bob LaSalle. Here. Barbara Rankin. Here. Diane McKnight. Here. Eileen Olson. Here. Marianne Jensen. Here. Ingra Rickenbach. Here. Todd Last is excused. Brian Boyce. Here. And Brian Grant. Okay. Okay, thank you. Our first presentation tonight is on the Great Shake for Emergency Preparedness. And our presenter is Martin Montalvo from Public Works. Good evening, everyone. Uh, for those of you that I haven't gotten to meet yet, my name is Martin Montalvo. I'm the new operations manager for the Public Works Department. I'm uh, I'm the new John Lewis, as I've been commonly referred to. <laughs> Are you the old John? You're approved. <laughs> <laughs> Verdict's still out on that one, John. Um, so I'm coming to talk to you guys today about uh, the Great Shake. Um, event which the city is participating in. This is a regional event that um, spans uh, all of Clackamas County. Most of the municipalities in Clackamas County are participating, including ourselves, um, the state of Oregon, most of the states on the western coast of the United States, and um, several countries, uh, including Australia, New Zealand, um, portions of Mexico that are all participating in this event. And it's basically an opportunity to bring awareness to um, seismic events and what we all were taught when we were school kids about duck and cover <coughs> and, and kind of reiterating some of the lessons learned and uh, especially in light of some of the recent natural disasters that have occurred um, within the Pacific Basin. So first thing we want to talk to you guys about is just to reiterate for yourselves what you were taught when you were kids, what do we do if there's a seismic event, and we want to talk about just drop, cover, and hold. And it's a little bit more than you probably learn when you're in grade school. Uh, there's some usefulness behind that. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize that we didn't have the screen now. Um, what all the lessons and all the experts have told us is, you know, when you experience a seismic event, your natural uh, predisposition is I'm going to run and get out of the building. Well, you're leaving yourself open for greater harm than if you just took, um, took cover where you were at and proceeded with your duck cover and hold um, procedures. So. We're trying to get out to you guys as community leaders for each of your organizations that if you'd care to participate with us on this, or, um, on this exercise date, um, communally, the region's doing this October 17th at 1017, and we're all going to be doing our drop, cover, and hold exercise during that time. So these are the basic uh, procedures, why we're doing this, some uh, things to avoid, exterior walls, um, hanging objects, um, mirrors, tall furniture, large appliances, kitchen cabinets, basic things that you don't necessarily take into consideration in your normal day-to-day -day activities, but we want everyone to be a little bit more cognizant of for five minutes out of their day on October 17th. So why do we tell people to drop and cover? Um, it's to protect you from flying and falling debris and other non-structural hazards. If you try and egress a, a building that you're in, the likelihood of you being hurt is actually greater by trying to get out of the facility than if you had just taken cover at the location that you were at. Um, fire rescue services um, and various other entities have done numerous studies on this and this is the proposed method for um, safe uh, survival from a seismic event. Okay. 
And then what they also speak to is the void space or the safety triangle that's created when you take cover and refuge underneath the desk, and we'll go on that a little bit further. Uh, another reason why they tell you don't try and, um, and leave the building that you're at um, is because current building codes that we currently live under here in the United States, you're more likely to survive a seismic event within a structure than, um, uh, than if you go outside and potentially endanger yourself by exposing yourself to falling debris trying to get out of the actual building. So the likelihood of the structure falling down and collapsing upon you is far less with our current building standards than you would have when you see all these media images after a seismic event in a third world country. So, so why not exterior walls? Um, we tell everyone if you're going to take cover in a facility, first of all, try and take cover underneath a desktop. That's your most stable, um, reinforceable point of, um, of refuge. If you can't get to underneath a desktop, then we tell you to take cover near an interior wall, not an exterior wall. And the logic behind that is pretty self-explanatory. Exterior walls, you're going to have windows, you're going to have architectural um, appliances that are there, you're going to have fr picture frames, other items that are bound to that exterior wall which tend to fall and cause greater damage to the individual than if you take cover next to an interior wall. Okay, so. This pictogram here kind of shows you that safety triangle that we talked about, about the likelihood of you being protected if something were to fall on the desk, the desk itself would collapse at the center of the um, point of impact, and then you would still be safe underneath that point of refuge. So the story everybody heard when you were kids is always take cover underneath the doorway that uh, one of the major doorways leading the exterior of the property is your safest location. That was brought about from pictures taken back in the 30s and the 40s of, oh, this adobe house you know, was completely destroyed except for the door frame. <coughs> it was an adobe house that was built before we had true building standards. Structurally, homes and structures that are engineered today are, are all comparably structurally sound throughout the entire facility. Um, we don't necessarily recommend everyone take cover underneath a doorway any longer. Our proposed um, safe uh, harborage areas are underneath the table, and if you can't get there, to an interior wall <coughs> up against the wall itself. Okay? We used to teach in kindergarten to hold on to the leg of the table yep. so the table might move. But no, that's a very good point. I, I kind of glossed over that. They do teach you, it, the protocol is to drop underneath a, a structure, to take cover underneath there, place your hands over your head and your neck to protect your vital organs, and then to hold on to the table legs. And the reason for that is because the table itself during a seismic event will start to shift. And if you're not holding on to it, trying to um, keep that location, your cover may just slide away from you and then you have nothing. So uh, thank you for bringing that up. I'm glad you pointed that out. <coughs> so. Other things to consider, so what do I do if I'm outdoors? Uh, move to a clear area, try and avoid any locations where there are overhead power lines. That's a pretty obvious hazard. Um, mm -hmm. Large trees, any signage, buildings or vehicles, or other overhead haz hazards that you may um, be exposed to. So just kind of be cognizant of your surroundings, that situ situational awareness that we try and teach everyone. Now what to do if you're driving? We tell everyone basically, Pull over to the first immediate area that you can that's safe to pull over. Um, and then disengage your vehicle and engage the parking brake. Uh, if there are any overhead hazards, um, like electrical power lines, if they strike the vehicle, that Tesla cage that you're essentially sitting inside will um, protect you from the power hazard. And stay inside the vehicle if that does happen until emergency crews can um, remove the electrical hazard. Okay. So what's the city doing to participate for this event? And this is why I'm here to talk to you guys, is kind of make you aware of what we're planning as an organization to make ourselves more prepared for the eventuality of a seismic event. Um, well, we're doing three things. Our, our approach is threefold. We have three levels of, of leadership here, and we're trying to touch base with each of them. So on um, October 17th, we are doing a uh, small presentation slash workshop for our city leadership, for our elected officials. Many of them not had to um, experience 
the legalities of engaging a local uh, declaration of, um, of emergency. So we're going to go through that simulated experience for the city commissioners, our mayor, and the city um, uh, city manager for everyone to participate in. We'll explain to them what are the requirements for declaring a local state of emergency. There are some thresholds that have to be met. Um, who has the authority to declare the local state of emergency? And then what's the eventual process for ratification by the city commission? What may be left of it? And then proceeding uh, to getting that local state of emergency process through our local county EOC, then through the state um, Division of Emergency Management and eventually to the federal government for a presidential declaration. Um, so we'll go through that on the 16th and all of that is in preparation for a um, tabletop exercise that we're going to be doing with our command staff here which is the city manager and all the directors and then um, some uh, managerial staff throughout the city. We'll be participating in a three, three and a half hour tabletop exercise in our city EOC where we'll be providing injects for them saying certain situations have happened within the city that's all been predicated by a 6.2 level uh, seismic event that occurred at roughly 5.30 this morning. How are you going to reestablish civil society for the citizens of Oregon City? So we'll be going through about a four hour exercise, about three and a half hours that we have scheduled in a half hour of post discussion um, with all of the directors and leadership. And then for just general city staff, we're asking them all and we're asking you guys to participate in the great shakeup. So if you're fortunate enough to be in City Hall on October 17th at <laughs> roughly 1017 and you see city staff cowering <laughs> underneath a desk, we are not being robbed. Okay, please do not call the PD because they'll be locked up with us. Um, we're going to be participating as an organization in the great shakeup. And the rationale for this is we want everyone to become situationally aware. In my own desk, I have an overhead array of three ring binders, and a couple of those weigh close to 20 pounds. And any one of them can come crashing down without a moment's notice and break my neck or at least cause me some serious damage that uh, the city health insurance is going to have to help cover. So we're trying to make everybody situationally aware within our organization, and we're asking you to take this information back to your organizations and help participate in the event. So how can you help? There are some brochures that we left some little flyers out there on the tabletop when you checked in. Please take one of those flyers back with you, and you can um, link in your fastest and easiest way is go to the city's own website, and we have had several links there for you to follow for the um, Great Shakeup event. I've also got four of the major um, <coughs> websites which we've been coordinating with and pulling some information off on our exercise prep, which you can go to and pull down any of this information, which I readily plagiarized for this PowerPoint for you. <laughs> All right. With that, I don't have any more information, but I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Yes? What you're saying, current building code, what year are you referring to? I mean, is there a year range? I mean, we've got some old <coughs> homes here in Oregon City that you're saying is the current code or... Well, it, the current code is really going to depend on the year that it was constructed. So most of the seismic um, retrofits that they were doing to building codes to start addressing some of these seismic events, those started happening in the 70s and the 80s. Um, from everything that I've read, and we've had a couple experts, we had a, um, a seismic geologist come in, she's a professional engineer, do a presentation to our department and to uh, members of our staff. The wood frame houses are less susceptible to catastrophic damage from a seismic event because the wood frame houses tend to just shift on the platform on the foundation <coughs> whereas when you start getting into brick and mortar um, structures that were constructed pre um, reinforcement requirements those are a little bit more susceptible to, death, to some of the seismic hazards can I tell you which specific code goes back and, and it starts addressing that no no, no I that's can't. 70s 80s that's what I was yeah wondering. Um, I can tell you for a lot of the discussions that I've had with some of the exercise planners um, for everything that we're looking at, if what I lovingly refer to is if you're in a Brady Bunch era house construction, you can look for some problems seismically when we start doing our um, exercise scenario. So, and I know that's a very broad generality, but it's a, something people can kind of latch on to. Damon? Um, as somebody who went through the Whittier earthquake down in uh, L.A., one of the good things about the old stick frame houses is they flex, they tend to stand up. 
The bad news is they flex. They tend to throw things off shelves and yeah. throw uh, pictures off the walls and stuff because they literally are like a rubber band snapping. And uh, so, you know, uh, you'll find that that your uh, curio cabinets will get knocked over because the wall slammed into them and and knocked them over and that sort of stuff. So. Something just as simple as one wood screw right into a stud can make a big difference. And that goes back to the point why they tell you to take shelter against an interior wall. The deflection on those walls is less on the interior than on the exterior walls, so the force isn't translated to you as much. Thank you for that. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Yeah. Uh, yeah. How about our uh, wonderful sewer and water system? What do you think? What, what do I think of it? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one of the things that we'll be exercising during um, our, our planned um, tabletop is how do we reestablish critical services? Um, we do have some um, aging infrastructure just like the rest of the country. Um, they're all questions that we'll have to deal with on the eventuality. We do try in our new projects to engineer those to a point where we have as minimal disruption for minor earthquakes. What we're dealing with for our scenario is a 6.2, and that's classified as a major earthquake event. So even some of the newer structures are going to see some catastrophic damage from that. <coughs> so our goal is how do we reestablish civil society and services within a set time frame? So that's what we'll be focusing on for our exercise. Amber? Martin, I was wondering, is this on? Yep. Um, what I was wondering is, are there major, what does Oregon City look like in terms of major fault lines and those kinds of things? Okay. Um, for the planning process with our exercise, we've done a little bit of research with that and then I can tell you that we suffer from one major fault line terminating right in the heart of Oregon City just before the bluffs. So that... That's why we have the falls. Yes. That, I don't want to go too much into it because it plays a lot into my scenario and I'll let a lot of the cat out of the bag. Okay. So, um, but there's, there's a, a report that was just completed, um, the Oregon Resiliency Plan. And um, in that it speaks to a lot of the natural hazards that we are dealing with within this region. Um, we as a city have an emergency operations plan which we pulled from very heavily for the preparation for the exercise. And one of the things that we've done in the, in the city's emergency operations plan is conducted a vulnerability and hazards assessment. So based on the myriad of hazards that the city could face, um, each of these criteria are evaluated and then the evaluators give a rank score for the likelihood of these incidences potentially affecting our community. I can tell you <laughs> from our emergency operations plan, the highest rated natural disaster that has a likelihood of impacting our community is a seismic event. So that's why we're, we're putting our eggs in that basket for this year's event. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? Yeah. One, in our area, I've, uh, we had one of my neighbors was a, a chief information officer of Dogami. And so as a result of that, I had, we, he did an assessment of Kanima and we're in a uh, ancient landslide of significance area and a lot of the the bluff areas there's a lot of areas through here are are in that uh, slide zone and he uh, if someone ever cares that's something you can really take a look at and it's important because um, just when you drive down towards my house the road is going like this there's a reason for it one other thing that I, I should mention, and I, I meant to bring it up to answer your question, Amber. The county is responsible as a local emergency manager for preparing a report. It's conducted every five years. It's a natural hazards mitigation report that states what are the hazards in this area. And if you read that report, it's a lengthy report. It's very, very detailed, though, and it gives you some good information about Oregon City itself and the various natural hazards that we face. And it speaks to our slide zones. Um, we actually have that mapped in our GIS, and that will come into play to some extent with our exercise. Um, and it speeds to some of our other natural vulnerabilities that we have in this area, including the seismic events. That's a publicly accessible document that you're welcome to take a look at, and it's accessible to the county EOC. 
our emergency operations plan is not something that we publicly disseminate. And there's reasons for that, post 9-11 reasons, where we try and keep that pretty close to the vest. But if you are interested in some more information regarding that, um, you can speak to the county and ask for the hazards mitigation plan. It also goes back to why your insurance rates are a certain rate. So. Martin, I wanted to uh, follow up on something Damon said. If the fault line is just below the bluff, does that mean that we would also be looking at flood issues in addition to just the simple shaking that would make our homes maybe? That's not a question that I think I could answer for you. Um, we, we would be facing, if we had a major seismic event, there would be a lot of ancillary um, natural hazards that we would be facing. Mm -hmm. But in terms of flooding, where they really pinpoint the likelihood of that is for some of the tsunami zone um, areas. Yeah. We're not, we're in the central valley of, mm -hmm. of the Oregon um, area, and it's, Oregon itself is broken up into three seismic areas. There's the coastal, the central, and then the eastern. Mm -hmm. The coastal area, which basically runs, oh, I'm trying to get my bearings, runs about as far as, um, I'm trying to... Uh, the foot of the Cascades is yeah. probably... I mean, there's Tillamook, you know... Yeah, Tillamook is about as inland as, as they speak about where they're going to experience tsunami events and mm -hmm. coastal flooding that's associated okay. with that. But yeah. the river's not, not so much. They're not likely to create a tsunami effect that would... Not anything that I've, I've read or have heard of. Um, there's not a, a, a riverine equivalent to a tsunami event that I've, I've seen or read anything okay. about. I mean, if there was a true tsunami, the, the I mean, our river elevation isn't that high, and there's not a lot of difference between <coughs> here and the coast in terms of elevation. So we'll see we'll see effects of that in our river, but I don't think mm -hmm. it's going to be to the the magnitude that we would expect, you know, to exceed flood levels and you know normal flood levels in Oregon City. Mm -hmm. I guess it depends on. Yeah. What time of year? How full mm -hmm. the rivers are? Those kind yeah. of things. Yeah. Well, the, yeah, I'm, I'm aware that the, the tide affects the Columbia as far back as Beacon Rock, so there would be an effect. Tide affects the Columbia. Right up to the, tide the affects. Falls. Yeah. How far? Yeah. All, All the way to the falls. falls. Yeah. Falls. Yeah. 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 Back yeah. The river. Oh, okay. It's, it's, yeah. It's, there's so tidal there effects would here. Be, so. It mm -hmm. seems like there would be. A, a um, max one, one thing. I'm I'm up here. Do you, um, Alice, can I? Oh, yes. You good with that? I just you, wanted to mention. I'm good with it. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I want to thank Martin. He's done an outstanding job for uh, the city pulling this emergency exercise together. And um, one of the many reasons why we hired Martin is because he's got a lot of experience with emergency management uh, through the state of Florida. So Martin's from the state of Florida. So mm -hmm. getting familiar with the Pacific Northwest and knowing exactly how flood inundation is going gonna, is gonna to affect the the. Uh, West Coast is probably not his expertise, but um, we're pretty fat, flat in Florida, so it's, <laughs> <laughs> there's a hurricane. We know it's going to flood. <laughs> but uh, with regard to evacuation plans and just just you know knowing the instant command system, um, Public Works has gone through some of that. But to be honest with you, it's not something we practice like police and fire tend to practice. And um, I know I personally felt like having the public works as a, the third leg to the response team because we really are was not there until you know and you know I know we've got some work to do but bringing Martin on is going to get us uh, much further there he's familiar with a lot of the federal forms because if you do get in an emergency there's a lot of federal process that you have to follow so it's just I, I, I sleep a lot better knowing that Martin's in town here to <laughs> kind of help, help us with those processes so uh, I you know I think the the city's uh, in in good standing going to be in better standing i mean clackamas county does have a, a good emergency management program and they they're supportive of the cities having us being more involved in that as opposed to just police and fire is something i think we need to focus on and that's you know it's not necessarily a, a capital project so much of what we've done in the past has been capital project related but we haven't had a strong focus on emergency management so to me that you know that's a pretty important piece and you know it when you got it when it happens so I'm hoping that we can tune this up a lot and be a lot more at ready when those events come come up so hopefully they won't okay. hopefully we won't have to test that a, for the kind of word kind words John um, one thing I just want to touch on that where where I came from in Florida and, and John spoke to this very accurately emergency response is really three prongs everyone always thinks of the flashing sirens as they are the emergency responders 
In Florida, when there's a natural disaster, we lovingly referred to ourselves, and we actually had t-shirts made up that said, public works were the tip of the spear. Because if there's a natural disaster, the fire trucks aren't rolling anywhere, and the police cars aren't rolling anywhere until public works and the heavy equipment come in and open up the road, because we maintain the right of way. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're hoping to instill and, and kind of further our, our you know, the city itself is in very good standing. John did a great job as the operations manager, but we're just trying to fine tune it a little bit more with that. Brian? Yeah, there, yeah. Uh, some of the jurisdictions uh, near here have uh, citizens trained to be emergency responders. Because, sure. yep. And uh, I was wondering if there's any, any idea of pursuing that in, in Oregon City. We do have a CERT community that's within the region. Um, for, for those of you that aren't familiar, there's a federal program called CERT, and it's uh, Citizen Emergency Response Teams. And we train citizens, laypersons. Um, you could be a bus driver during the day. You can do any, anything in your normal day-to-day um, -day life. And you're trained up on some of these emergency response protocols, and you're basically brought in as a, a supplemental force during an emergency event to help address some of the needs within your community. So they teach you some basic first aid. They teach you some basic damage assessments, which are extremely useful when we can send a group of volunteers out to an area and we've got you working on the same protocol as everyone else with doing some damage assessments for us. Um, it's a program I was active back in Florida with. It's something that we would love to instill here. I'm not aware of a formal CERT organization in Oregon City. We do have several formalized CERT groups surrounding us, but I don't believe we have one here in Oregon City. Is that something the city would like to you know, sponsor or become involved with? Baby steps. <laughs> I've got a lot on my plate right now. Um, but I, I, I think that's something that we would definitely like to um, approach in the future. Yeah, I, I don't. it's not really in the two-year work plan, but it's a good thing to have going. We would like to. And the thing with CERT is it's completely citizen driven. Um, you can start CERT teams, you can receive the training through the local counties or what's referred to as UASI, it's the Urban Area Security Initiative. They, they all do training that's open to the general public. Um, there's nothing precluding citizens from trying to start their own CERT um, certification and start a group. <coughs> In terms of the city supporting that, that's something right now where I, I'm trying to get our, all of our ducks in a row and then we'll, we'll move on to expanding that. Okay. Any other questions, comments, concerns, complaints? <coughs> Not uh, well, I thank you for your time okay. um, and I wish you all well. Feel free if you have any questions or concerns, you can contact us at operations. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Mario, don't forget to take your purses there. Hold on. Actually, those aren't bad. My wife probably <laughs> no, would take them. You can pass them to me. <laughs> well, I was wondering who those were. <laughs> yeah, it's his. <laughs> Come on now, they're men's carry all. <laughs> Thank you. They're your. Okay, thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. European men meds. Okay, our next agenda item is our Ask Oregon City Public Works. I've got a few items to go over. I just um, <laughs> thought I would hand out, start the meeting with a handout that um, Katie made copies of for us. It's um, a hot topic that came up a couple weeks ago with regard to sidewalk maintenance. And so uh, just to give you a little background, there's a a group of property own owners along Boynton Street who were um, through our routine process of when we receive a customer complaint of trip hazards along a particular route that comes to code enforcement code enforcement sends out a letter and the property owners typically take that letter and grumble about it a little bit and then take some action in this case um, there was a, a group of neighbors from the Boynton area that came to a city commission meeting and stirred things up just a little bit <clears throat> and uh, so in response to that effort we kind of committed to having a neighborhood meeting with the with the group and so we scheduled a neighborhood meeting with the group and um, that became uh, a more of a media event one of the neighbors there um, notified just about every 
media outlet that there was that we were having a neighborhood group. And while that changed the um, makeup of the meeting and made me a little bit nervous going into that, I think it really kind of worked out well. We got uh, some good press on that and were able to um, speak to s several issues with regard to sidewalk maintenance. And the, the um, I, I think the bottom line is, is in Oregon City, um, like many, many other cities, property owners still are responsible for maintenance of their sidewalks, even when uh, there's requirements for street trees, even when uh, there, there was old requirements for narrow planter strips and, and maybe inappropriate street trees. There, the, still the obligation for maintenance of those uh, sidewalks lies with the property owner. But we've done several things to kind of soften our approach and what, what I've handed out here is, an, is a new neighborhood letter um, that we're going to start using, which uh, helps to explain the city's position a little more than so, a letter that might come from the police department or code enforcement division. So a lot of people were just struck um, by the fact that they were getting a letter from the police department that was enforcement related. They didn't care for that too much. And then the other thing we put together was um, and it's it, we, we put it on a little bit larger paper so it's a little easier to read but this safe sidewalk uh, safe sidewalks require community stewardship um, flyer so both of those items will be the first thing that a customer will see when we receive a complaint and um, so that that's that was probably a biggie now uh, I'll, if you attended the meeting or watched the meeting the neighbor the neighbor that brought in the concern for a letter was was quoting from a letter that she received in 2010. So that letter had changed several times since that 2010 letter, which made it kind of difficult for us to defend in that, in that uh, city commission meeting because we were, none of us had read the letter in, in some time. And so it was kind of, we didn't notice that it was a 2010 letter. But, um, but we, so we, anyway, we, we went through that and we think we've got a much better process. Um, we, we've done several other things. First of all, for those Boynton Street area property owners, those only, m mostly because of a mistake on my part, we've extended their uh, repair time for s to uh, an additional six months. The code actually stipulates that it's a 90-day requirement. And we've always been pretty cooperative with property owners in trying to make those repairs. So we typically do some level of extension. But at the, at the heat of the moment in that particular meeting, I said, yeah, we'll go ahead and extend the sidewalk repair uh, timeline for another six months. So we did that for that particular neighborhood. Um, we've, we've internally just kind of revisited the code and gotten more familiar with that. The code is very uh, specific on this particular issue, whether it be timing or who's responsible. It's clear that the city at some point in time made the determination that the property owners are responsible for their sidewalks. Um, we've kind of gone over our construction standards, make sure they're still in line with what we think needs to be built when a property owner does replace its uh, sidewalks. Um, we're doing a better job kind of tracking our internally those um, <coughs> When, when there's a complaint that's, that's uh, reported, tracking you know, when the notification letter went out, where the property owner is in the process, and trying to do a better job communicating between um, public works and um, code enforcement. Um, we're allowing for, um, before we would only allow a property owner to grind um, a grade change if it uh, was a half inch or less, and we've decided to take that to one inch. There's a lot of property owners that just have uh, slight grade change, um, a slight offset, but it always, almost always exceeds the half inch mark. So we're allowing that to happen up to an inch, which is, which according to our inspection staff, that'll be a pretty big help. We'll also allow property owners to, to do some form of meandering if they want to save the tree as opposed to removing a tree, meandering of the sidewalk so that uh, that can happen. And just trying to make sure our permit process is, um, is as clear as it can be. Oh, one other big thing is you can now get a group permit for, this, for uh, the, the price of a regular permit. So we've discounted, well, we've done a couple things. We've discounted our full, our, or I think our um, permit price for a, a sidewalk repair is $143. So we've cut that in half. So that's a $72 permit now. And then if you come in with uh, up to five property owners that want to do a group repair using a contractor, we'll get you a, a permit to the contractor for those five for the full price, 100, 
it's to, it'd be $143 for that permit, but it, you can spread it amongst uh, five people as opposed to one person. Do they have to be adjacent? They don't have to be adjacent, but we kind of need them in the same neighborhood. So um, we'll, we're leaving that kind of up to, I think we've internally set some, di you know, some distance or in the same neighborhood or on the street, same street, something like that. So a lot of effort with um, <coughs> sidewalk repair and seems like most of the difference is with, with regard to our approach and trying to soften that approach just a little bit. Any questions on that item? Um, if you haven't noticed, they're painting the elevator. They're doing it kind of slowly but surely. There's a small team, and um, it's kind of impacted by the amount of time that we have with good weather and the amount of time that we actually have a railroad um, monitor there. And whenever we're working in the railroad grade, we have to have a monitor. And so if we don't have a monitor available or if the railroad doesn't have a mon uh, monitor available, then we can't necessarily work in that area. So um, it's coming along slowly but surely. You, if, if you haven't noticed, there's a more of a silver look to the um, elevator uh, observation deck. So take a look at that. It's If you remember the I think we showed you some concepts of that. It's basically going to be silver and white. Okay. I expect that'll keep that work will continue for the next probably three weeks here, weather depending. Um, Public Works has been involved in a lot of transportation planning beyond our transportation system plan. Now the region's looking at uh, regional projects and how they're going to. Um, plan for more regional projects so that includes projects in Oregon City so they we've been working with Metro and some of the other um, local cities in the county to kind of figure out what projects should be at the top of the list for for you know regional funding um, there's also Metro's working on getting approval for the active transportation plan which is talks a lot more about walking and biking solutions so a lot of that information is available on their website I didn't bring any of that for you, but there's, there's, there's just a lot of information about both the regional transportation plan and this active transportation plan. So take a look at that. I mentioned last time Main Street alleys, and we, we did get approval from the Urban Renewal Commission to fund uh, completion of two of the alleys, the alley between 7th and 8th and the alley between 8th and 9th and between Railroad Avenue and Main Street. Is that, so it's, it's two alleys, two segments of alleys um, right in the core of downtown. We're still working on our sewer master plan and some of the modeling that goes with that. I know that's not real exciting stuff, but we did do a short presentation for the City Commission at the last meeting on the 2nd. Um, so if you're, you know, if you're interested in sewer master planning, sewer systems are pretty important, especially in some of our older neighborhoods. There's um, concerns about the condition of those pipelines and, uh, you know, what needs to be done to both uh, keep them leak-free and uh, for those that need to be bigger, making sure they're big enough. We're also um, working on some traffic uh, traffic study for the. 10th Street down near Dutch Brothers. I think I also mentioned this at the last meeting, but um, you know we continue to hear complaints about the left turn off of 10th Street into the Dutch Brothers driveway. <coughs> so we've talked about it a little bit at the TAC meeting, and um, just talked to the consultant who did a study, started a study back in 2009 that we're going to try and finish up and look to see what solutions are there. There's not many, and I, you know there might be problems associated with creating some kind of a hard barrier along there to prevent that movement. So we want to be sure whatever we do down there is going to be um, a good fix. Transportation Advisory Committee has been talking a little bit about bicycling in Oregon City, both mountain biking, more of a recreational biking, and uh, commuting bike, uh, biking, uh, biking for we're getting from point A to point B, <laughs> transportation. <laughs> yeah, I was having trouble coming up. Um, there's a, there is actually some some pretty strong interest in more mountain biking in in Newell Canyon, for instance, and so uh, there's just uh, it's kind of gaining a little bit of momentum. I don't know how far that will go, but that's something that the transportation advisory committee talked about, and we've been staff has been directed to kind of pursue a couple things there. Already talked about sidewalk maintenance. Working with the school district on Gaffney Lane and the elementary school there, we're going to try a test um, 
project there that um, will allow the school's buses to load and offload along the sidewalk out in the public right-of-way as opposed to in on the school grounds, which is something we haven't done before, and I'm a little reluctant, but we said we'd give it a try. Um, right now, a lot of the Oregon City schools just really struggle with um, these older design parking lots. A lot more parents, a lot, many more parents than, than it used to be drive their kids to school as opposed to allowing them to bike and walk to school. <coughs> and because of that, it, and drop off and pick up, there's usually a lot of conflicts between um, pedestrians, usually kids, and vehicles. So trying to work with the school district on that. Also worked with the school district on a parking problem in the Caulfield neighborhood where high school kids were parking off campus and they were not, the neighborhood was not very appreciative of that. So I think we have a solution there. Um, we hope to put together a um, corridor study for Lynn Avenue, Leland Road, and Myers Road. So if you're familiar with Lynn Avenue, you drive up Fifth Street and you eventually, that eventually turns to Lynn. And um, there's an interest in seeing better biking and walking solutions along there. That's a tough corridor, though, so we're going we're gonna, to uh, see if we can't do some uh, corridor planning work there with the civil engineer who can help us through that. I wanted to mention an award we got for, um, this is a national award that we got for the Jug Handle Project. We um, got word of this several months ago, but uh, Alita actually went... Um, back east to uh, Lita Froman Goodrich, who was the project manager on this project. She actually went back east to accept the award. It's, it's the project of the year through the American Public Works Association for transportation in the 25 million to 75 million category. Our project was at the smaller end of that range, but um, that's also kind of one of the reasons why I think it's kind of impressive because there were much more expensive projects that we were competing against, and this is a pretty competitive um, category. So uh, I, th I think that says a lot about um, that project team that worked on that. So it's a heavy award, so be um, careful with that. What was the name of the award again? It's it's the American Public Works Association um, uh, Project of the Year for Transportation. you want to pass it around or not? Sure. Um, capital projects, we're kind of winding down. Capital projects. There's still one kind of ongoing, which is on Claremont Way. We're just kind of dancing in between uh, rain showers and trying to complete paving work with um, wet conditions. So we're almost done with that segment of uh, Claremont Way. So that's turned out to be a pretty good project. Uh, the McLaughlin Boulevard Phase Two project is going to go out for bid here fairly soon. We expect to, not remembering the dates exactly, but I think. Uh, uh, Mid-November, we hope to actually open bids on that project. And if you remember, that's from the Clackamas River Bridge to Dunes Drive, and a <coughs> segment of Dunes Drive. There'll be um, some nice improvements along there. Other than that, nice. do you have a I completion have. that you are looking at for that project, McLaughlin Oakham? Phase Two? It's a one-year project, so we're hoping oh, okay. it'll be done before Christmas of 2014. Okay. Uh, <coughs> hey, John, I had a. Um, I just had two thoughts, and, and I don't. This might not be the place to say, it, but I, I, was, I think there's some concern about the alleys being closed, and even even with the topical thing with earthquakes and and egress and for um, service of um, bakery trucks and and um, the alleys have been so integral for you know for commerce for for businesses, um, and I, and I I get the the idea the intent to to make them you know look more attractive, and I remember. You know, being a kid, and there was a couple alleys we always like to go look at because you could see the cobblestones. Uh, you could still see cobblestones on them, or bricks, I think. And um, you know, so it, has there been any other discussion about? Has there been any um, other voices that were concerned about closing of the alleys at all? Or is it, are we? Some, there's a few of us merchants that were concerned about it. We have such a almost a wind tunnel coming down Main Street with hardly any ability to go left and right and in, in, in so many uh, you know in, in one way directionals and and um, uh, some of the drivers uh, we, we were talking about it we're a little concerned about it they have a tough time finding places to, to uh, <coughs> load and unload their their various trucks for the restaurants and there's you know 16 16 liquor licenses on Main Street and 
and that's a lot of deliveries of you know food and bread and pop and beer and things um so that's just one concern we had and i had a thought too is, is um with the trees that we were a lot of us when they did the sidewalks on main street um some of those mat- trees are pretty mature that we have already down there um and we were concerned that with our brand new sidewalks that they didn't replace those trees. Um, can we preempt and, and, and maybe take a, a tree down that was up? They're all pretty uniform styled trees and sizes, so I think it's kind of silly to do that. But we were hoping, and a lot of the trees were planted, um, you know, some of them were planted within four or five feet of light poles in the, you know, in the, in the, the, cr- the trees encapsulates the lights, uh, and uh, although our lights are brighter now, uh, it's, there's still a lot of them. I think code used to be within 15 feet of a light pole, and it's just what it is. I mean, the, the sidewalks are done, but <coughs> is there is that possible to to request uh, for downtown merchants to um, request a, a a tree removal and then? And, and well, I think let me let me start with the first one, which is the alley question. Um, at this point in time, I don't know of any other alley closures that we're proposing, and the closures are more for routine through traffic. Most of them have bollards that prevent vehicles from going in and out of there. Um, there's a balance between pedestrian access and vehicle access, but those the, the only alleys that I know of that are closed are those that are already closed. We're not proposing to close any other alleys. Okay, and I think even on. Um, in in portions of those they're open so it's more like half the alleyway is closed so on the back end of those um, uh, alleyways there's there's still vehicle access for those for truck parking and uh, we have talked a fair amount to neighboring business owners and there's uh, kind of a might be a couple lines of thinking with regard to closure of alleyways but uh, what we haven't heard of any negative comments with regard to the two alleys that we're talking about two alley segments that we're talking about. And I don't know of any other discussions of any other segments being closed. Sure. And then with regard to the trees, uh, uh, you know, I'd want to look into that. I think, you know, uh, some sidewalks along Main Street were updated. Others weren't. Some street trees were taken out. Others weren't. And there was some um, evaluation that was done at the time of those trees that were left. Uh, and that's not to say that, you know, in a couple of years we shouldn't reevaluate that tree, whether or not it's becoming a problem for the sidewalk or if it's, you know, if it's inundating a street light, we can usually um, do some trimming associated with that. Um, but uh, we're not, a, I mean, we're not opposed to removing them. We just would like to do that in a fashion that's environmentally sensitive to the tree. And sure. um, if it needs to come out, though, there's no reason why we can't pull it and put in another one right in its place. Well, John, in in that uh, vein, the tree that blocks the post office sign, is that anything that anyone has complained about? I don't know how many times I've driven right by the post office because I couldn't see the driveway because the sign was not visible. It's only visible in the winter months when there's no leaves on the tree that's in front of it. Is that something that needs to be taken care of, or am I the only one that misses the driveway. <laughs> I missed it. I thought it was just me. <laughs> I don't think I've noticed it. Um, is it a street tree or is it a tree behind the sidewalk? I, well, I'd have to look again, but it's close to the sidewalk and their sign is also close to the sidewalk. So it blocks it if you're going I've not ever heard down. of that. OC request. Mm. Okay. Put it in. He can I'll look at it. All right. <laughs> yeah, I just use biscuits and then I turn the other way. <laughs> I, uh, I can find biscuits with my eyes closed. <laughs> okay. Well, we, and I don't know. We can look at that. I don't, I'm trying to remember. Alice? Uh-huh. I don't remember oh, street trees along that section. Yeah, Ingra, did you have a comment? Both offices on the yeah, wall. I have a question. I don't know if I understood it right or not. But, uh, John, did you say if a group <coughs> permit was going to be issued, it would be at full price? Right. It would be $143, but you could get up to five property owners to cover that. Because this letter doesn't say that. Uh, this letter says that uh, it's covering two to five property repair. Well, it doesn't say anything about the price. It can be arranged at the same commit rate. Yeah. Well, number two. Oh, number yeah. Five. Which implies $72. Yeah. Yeah. Just for your information. Okay. Thank you. Good to know. Yep. 
I might want to say original permit rate. Mm -hmm. Well, except if somebody's going to get this, I won't have any idea what that is. Okay. We've, a we've actually not mailed this out yet. <laughs> so there's still time for editing. Paul? <laughs> <laughs> uh, John, uh, sure. in right th this point that Alice brought up, and it's, uh, yeah. it's in effect uh, site view of right-of-ways when you're coming out. And we have a, a lot of that uh, around the city where, where, you, where either trees or, fences. or or even fences in, in in certain areas which are critical and you have uh, or even overgrowth of just stuff uh, you get to a point where uh, I pulled up the city code on right-of-way and I was looking down at it what you're supposed to be able to see to get around corners or get get to uh, to make turns out uh, like when we come out of Kanema and I come down to Highway 99 uh, on hedges, I cannot see south. Mm -hmm. Physically, without pulling my car quite a ways out into the high speed th through traffic, we hope is slowing <laughs> down coming on Highway 99. But by city code, what is there when I read the that uh, the code for that uh, uh, they're in violation and and I start looking around when I go up the hill on Ganong and I turn on to uh, fourth <coughs> I can't see around a corner and it's a real tight corner and the brush is all out and high and everything there and people we have numerous very very close calls at that this little corner just be, because you can't see right. and I I when I went into the code and I have it printed out sitting up on my desk to sometime quietly make a comment about it but we should be we should be looking at that because you have code uh, that now exists that uh, we're not in compliance with in a lot of places around the city no, I'd agree with that especially this time of year when things are hanging kind of low and the leaves are are in full bloom. Uh, I we we heard one recently from a from a, a an avid bicyclist here in town who's fr you know frustrated with low hanging limbs that are that end up in the bike lanes. So it's a challenge because um, it's again it's going to be um, like the sidewalk trip hazards. We don't have the staff to go out and find all those. It's going to be complaint driven, just like sidewalk trip hazards are. So my my recommendation, Paul, would be to actually you know pick those locations where you're most concerned about and notify code enforcement through the report a problem um, and and they'll they'll send out a letter they know they know the code <laughs> as well so they will send a letter and they'll require it which will require that property owner to take care of their frontage and so you know it's so that's the best approach because we don't have a we really don't have an active tree trimming program that um, the citizens would pay for to trim you know property owners frontage I mean most of us in this room I guess is you maintain your frontage enough to keep good sight distances and that's the appropriate way to manage your property but not everybody does that it's the public safety <coughs> aspect of it that when, when, it, when it compromises public safety yeah. uh, and public uh, the you know the best good of the public is yeah. where we really so need to if you Paul if you would <laughs> report those that'd be the best way to get action and then we code enforcement follows through with that and they'll send a letter they give them some time I don't remember for that kind of a problem how much time they give them but they give them some time to get it taken care of <coughs> but they are required to take care of it Kathy okay since we're since we're talking about this <coughs> the development is very new on Partlow and South End you know where I'm talking about and the, the walkway <coughs> So far back, if I anybody there pulls out without going over the sidewalk and up to where you can <coughs> see the school buses and whatever coming from John McLaughlin and see the traffic going down towards it, if they do, <coughs> they're going to get hit. So where you put that sidewalk, you're blocking people that may come up after you've pulled forward. It, it's really a bad um, 
way to put that <coughs> sidewalk, a lining that <coughs> road, because you have to park, stop behind the sidewalk, because that's where the sign is. And then you have to pull forward. Yeah. And people come up behind you, they can. <coughs> and it's a very bad turn lane. Whether you're in the left or right turn lane for there, it is really needs to be readdressed, maybe re paint it closer because um, eventually somebody's going to get hit because they're thinking they could make that decision and they cannot make it without doing something that if somebody's behind and complains or an officer sees you, they will think you did not stop for that pedestrian because it is really, it's quite a ways back. Yeah, I think the should, they should check in and see. Part um, of the problem with that is the 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 next property to the south is undeveloped, right? So there's no, no sidewalk nope. there. Right? Yeah, that's true. Uh, that's true. There's a property on the corner that's got sidewalks, but the next one down, yes, there's a ditch and and yes. you know it's it needs that section of roadway needs to be built. And it's yeah. not built yet, so I get that you have to stop before the crosswalk, just like you're supposed to. And then you have to roll out. Yes. And so. But yeah. It so is what it is. I'll, if anybody gets a ticket, I'll send them to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have questions for John? If not, we'll <coughs> go ahead to our next item. Thank you, John, very much. The approval of the minutes from our August meeting. <coughs> Do we have any corrections? Oh, just one. Kathy? It's really a Philly stocking and Philly heart. It's got the A in there. Where? Is that under round table? <coughs> oh, thank you. Well, she actually, it, Amy does such an excellent job of this. If you ever see an acronym you don't know, on yeah, I missed the A and the. Oh, did you? Right there. So well, I'll okay, fix. okay. Yeah, that's just a typo. That doesn't require action. Mm -hmm. It's a typo. Mm -hmm. Any other suggestions to move to approve? Okay, Second. Paul. What's been whoa, moved whoa, whoa, and. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh. <laughs> Paul moved. Paul. <laughs> Kathy seconded. Got it. To approve, as <laughs> corrected that one small typo. Got it. Okay, Tony. Yeah. Uh, Michael Berman? Yep. Paul Edgar? Yes. Amber Holbeck? Aye. Amy Wilhite? Aye. Kathy Hogan? Yes. Steve Anderson? Aye. Faith Leith? Aye. Damon Maybe? Abstain. Alice Watts? Aye. Bob LaSalle? Yes. Barbara Rankin? Yes. Diane McKnight? Yes. <coughs> Eileen Olson? Yes. Inger Rickenbach? Yes. Marianne Jensen? Yes. Ryan Boyce? Yes. <coughs> passes. Okay, thank you. Nice job, Amy, again. All right, we're going to move on to unfinished business. Our first item is the farmer's market. We have been participating with our booth for the CIC and Faith is going to share her experiences on that. I guess I'll just pull this over. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, we um, had a booth at the safety fair, the 28th annual Oregon City Health and Safety Fair in the Danielson parking lot and that was September 21 from 10 to 3. And Bob LaSalle, Steve Anderson, Paul Edgar, and I were there and uh, took turns. We handed out about 50 flyers and uh, talked to a lot of the people in the community about wh who we are and what we do. And um, it helped having the, the map there that drew people. And um, Steve brought his dog, which drew the kids, which was <laughs> helpful. <laughs> and um, so we, I was there for six hours, and the time just flew by. It was really fast. I mean, it was a really neat safety fair. If people haven't gone to it, you really should. Um, so anyway, uh, we'll go to that. I, I sent a, a thank you to the person who, who uh, ran it, and uh, she said, you know, we're welcome to come back next year. And it was, it was very successful. So 
we're going to do another one on October um, 7, 17th. It's the Thursday. No, October 19th. Yeah, Sorry. Saturday. October 19th on Saturday. And I um, already have uh, Jackie from the market manager of the um, farmer's market said that we could have a booth there. And we have to start s to set up at 8.15 a.m. And then it goes until 2. And you break down at 2. And it would be nice to have a couple of volunteers that would be willing to go on the mm -hmm. Saturday. It's like a, a week from Saturday. Faith, you have my name down, don't you, to help yeah. us set up? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> would anyone else like to just take a, a couple of hours? And all you do is sit there and you ask people where they, you know, where they live, <coughs> and then they look on the map and point it out, and then you tell them what their neighborhood association is. And, uh, and it's very, Barbara? Okay. Steve, could you come in with your dog again? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought maybe you just wanted the dog. This we time. do. <laughs> <laughs> but we, he has to be chaperoned. <laughs> oh. Could the dog bring you, Steve? <laughs> yeah, but it, I'll, I'll try to make it. Okay. Madam Chair, may I make a comment? Yes. Um, <clears throat> being there with Faith was quite an enlightening experience. And she's quite a sales lady. <laughs> she was going out in the fairway and grabbing people and pulling them there. So <coughs> if you want to set up anything where you want to have people to talk to you, get Faith involved. Mm -hmm. well, I, 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 I second that. She <laughs> was, uh, she's a very, very powerful and persuasive out there. My kids were <laughs> impressed. My kids were impressed. They like to see that, oh, this is what you do. So that was nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Faith, I would just advise that there's no dogs allowed at the uh, farmer's market. market. Oh. Do you still want me to come? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Just giving you that option. Yes. Actually, I think Alice said she was going to bring Halloween candy, so that might be yeah. oh. more of a draw for yeah. a dog. That's okay. also a draw for kids, yes. I discover. Yes. <laughs> and the, while the kids are eating their candy, that we talk yes. to the parents. Big so big so that's the end of my report. Or Thank you. And um, I also wanted to just comment this faith's participation in organizing this was our second foray into having a booth. We also <laughs> were present at the neighbor's night out. And at that, um, it, it's interesting. I thought I had reported on this, but it wasn't with this group. It was with my own neighborhood association. But I wanted to thank Bob, LaSalle, and Tony, and Ingra for for coming and helping me with that it was a hot evening and we did a good job th we had the same experience that you did faith people were really friendly and I, I it's always amazing how many people don't realize that there are active neighborhood associations that they can become involved in and and have a have a say in their in their city's um, livability issues so it's a great opportunity for this group okay the next item of business comes under new business and before we get to the bylaws I just want to uh, indicate that I also have an extra item that's going to fall under new business at the end of our discussion of the uh, bylaws <coughs> and budget discussion. Jim Nasita is here tonight and he has something he wants to bring forward. He's gonna, I told him he could have three minutes to make a presentation and he'll make that after our budget update information. <coughs> So, item number one, ratification of proposed bylaw changes. Our chair, Bob, has said. <coughs> In order to, the time has finally come after many, many months of working on these bylaws. Uh, the vote is finally here, thank goodness. We need a two thirds of the CIC members in attendance to have the vote. We have that easily this evening. And then two thirds of the CIC <coughs> members present have to vote yes in order to pass the bylaws changes. I think I counted 17. Mm -hmm. So that would mean we would have to have 12 yes votes to adopt the new bylaws. Um, I guess the procedure is to call for a motion and second and then discussion. Mm -hmm. that, would, that would be the proper procedure. Okay. Is there a motion, Steve, Steve. to uh, accept these bylaws 
and then a second. Do I'll have, second that. Okay, Brian. Now we can have discussion. Does anyone have any <coughs> comments? Damon? Um, yeah, I, I actually have a few, and, and I'm sorry, Bob, that I didn't get these to you earlier, but between getting married and then having my dad pass away and then turning 50, I've been busy these last <laughs> two months. Um, the first one is on the bottom of page one. Um, isn't the county community planning organizations, aren't they CPOs, not PLOs? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not the planning liberate liberate. That's an easy type of fix. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we can only hope. You know. <laughs> um, then s the next one is on um, page three, the section five at the top. Um, it says a uh, representative misses three regular meetings in one year shall be deemed. It should say a like, calendar year or something because it, otherwise it could be implied as a rolling year or, you know, you missed last March and you missed February and, you know, so it should say, I think, should say calendar year or have some delineation of what that year Within is. 12 months. And is yeah. this unexcused absences or excused? I mean, if you're either one is it's it's not specified excused or unexcused right and <coughs> so I mean at the very least it needs to say calendar um, whether we want to get into the whole issue of excused or unexcused it's tw it's 25 percent of the meetings you will have missed and does that mean that you can in in my particular case had we had a meeting in August I would have missed August and September and if I'd missed one earlier we wouldn't have we didn't have a neighborhood meeting for me to be reappointed to come here tonight um, because the way this reads is you're you miss your third meeting and you're gone um, and the and your neighborhood has to now act to reappoint you um, it's an automatic e event that happens at your third meeting so um, it, that, that seems a little Draconian, but I can understand that for the vast majority of people, it's not going to be an issue. Um, those few times it does happen, but again, I still think it needs to say either in a 12 month period or in a calendar year just to delineate when the clock starts and stops. Well, I think our objective was to have it a rolling year, <coughs> not necessarily a calendar year. Um, we could certainly change that if the members wish That's to do so. a lot of paperwork for Amy to keep track of. Okay, you missed April, so now I have to keep track of the next 12 months. Yeah, I like Whereas calendar. Whereas if it's just, you look at the, the calendar year and she can mm -hmm. pull it up and there it is. Because this is know. what I'd like to bring to every meeting. Mm -hmm. That's a valid well, point. And then um, that gives people to have to start over freshly in January too so it's like getting an amnesty or something well and, and there's <coughs> probably some people that you know I, and I don't know about this group in general but I know you get the snowbirds who are gone December January so that's two months but it's on two different calendars they got to look at what happens the rest of the year but um, so anyway that's my comment there <coughs> that I think it should at least say don't calendar is that yeah. kind of a general yeah. consensus if nobody has any objections we'll, we'll change it to the calendar mm -hmm. here that's good All right. um, I, I don't hear any objections so we're going to just insert that without making a formal motion for that I'll probably need to make that as a friendly amendment to the yeah we already have uh, a motion on the floor yeah, to so. approve them as well, when we're done discussing we could have an amended motion that's that right yes yeah. let's do that the let's do that discussed. um the next is page five <coughs> section three you've got end paras and then commas I don't think you need those end paragraph marks at all I'll say that again I didn't <coughs> in section three you have article eight <coughs> section four end paragraph comma five end paragraph <coughs> comma oh, those, okay. those crescents don't need to be there right. okay so okay. that that's just another editing thing for when it okay 
Uh, page six. <coughs> Five A. Um, it says a citizen is to complete a comment card prior to the meeting and submit it to a staff member. Does that mean only Katie or John? Or does that mean <coughs> an elected board member? Or is that Katie, John, and any board member? You haven't defined a staff member. So. Well, I think our, our intent was a staff member of the staff of the city. Okay. It would not be one of the officers. Okay. So it should say city, city staff member. Ordinarily, it's the it should liaison. Be, it should say liaison yeah. rather than, because John shouldn't be. Yeah. yeah. What am I going to do with this? Um, <laughs> John has a perfectly good assistant now, so he's got to yeah. understand that. But I can walk up and give it to John, and John could put it away, and then right. I can say, "You guys didn't," you know. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and just a general comment about uh, some of the duties we're putting on the city liaison. For a while, CIC operated without city staff. If that should happen to occur again, because now the city defunds the position or whatever, what does that do as an impact to our bylaws when there is no staff member available? So what I would say in this case is to a staff member or chair. You know, that way the chair would, you know, if Katie isn't here, the chair gets the comments. If Katie isn't here because of budgeting reasons for six or seven or eight months, we, it's automatically fixed. That's no big deal. Sounds reasonable to me. Um, and then we get to section three uh, of page seven. Sorry. Section three and four talk about the nominating committee and the election of officers being in November, the November general meeting, <coughs> December general meeting, but our, our people are elected for two-year positions. Um, so I think it should say um, in, in November of an election year and December of an election year, so that we don't end up with people arguing that it's December and we have to have an election, but there's nobody up, but you know, you said we have to because it's December. Because we've had that confusion with that with yeah. with some neighborhoods and <clears throat> so that way if it's the election year, whether it's an odd or even year, it doesn't matter, it's whatever it is, um, then it's clear that it's not something that happens every year. It happens when elections are necessary. So that would be to A, C, and then number four. Um, oh yeah, three A, three C, and four. So just kind of like comment. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just looking to see if there's. Yeah, I I don't see a way. Uh, uh, an easier way to put it than to just add. If you just comma in an election year. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. That sounds yeah. fine. Take that. I was just looking to see if it was like you could say in section one, this is applicable in election years, blah. But no, it's easier mm -hmm. just to add it than to try to rewrite a paragraph. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's not do any more rewriting. Yeah. Please. No, I understand. <laughs> so again, I'm sorry I didn't get this to you any earlier. I literally. We knew lost you'd this. catch it. We were just waiting. Well, I literally <laughs> lost all this until I was going through some of my dad's records. I went, oh, there's where that thing is. And so, um, anyway, that is the end of my proposed friendly amendments. <laughs> okay, do you want to make a motion to change, and then we'll, we'll vote on the change, the amendment. Wait, we actually, we amendment. have a motion on the floor. So we if Steve Anderson would like to amend his motion. To incorporate all of the <coughs> changes that Damon brought up. Would you like to do yes. that? Okay, and then the seconded easier. person was Brian Boyce. Would yes. you like to? Okay. I, I will second that. Okay. <laughs> so now we're voting oh, on. Is there any other discussion? Is there any other Amendment discussion? Changes. So now we're voting on the 
document as changed by Damon's suggested suggestions and the amendment that we agreed upon. Are we ready? Okay. Tony? Yes. Michael? Yes. Paul? Yes. Amber? Abstain. Amy? Aye. Kathy? Aye. Steve? Aye. Faith? Aye. Damon? No. <laughs> Alice? Yes. Bob? Yes. Barbara? Yes. Diane? Yes. Eileen? Yes. Ingra? Yes. Marianne? Yes. Brian? Yes. Okay. Fifteen is four, one against, and one abstention. Okay. All right. We have new bylaws. And Thank if, you. If I may, just to go on record as to why I said no. Um, first off, I was pretty sure this was going to pass, uh, but um, <coughs> I really am I'm not a big fan of narrowing the citizens involvement council down to a residential organization that excludes businesses I think that both Main Street and um, and the chamber should have a seat here that's when I originally wrote the document up seven eight years ago I included them for a reason but I understand where people are coming from so I'm, I'm on record as to why I said no and I said no and it still passed so there we go <laughs> You'll get that in the minutes, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And next time to the minutes will be added for Amber to have a, sp a spot, just like John of Asco. Yeah, and I appreciated that. I, I think that's very appropriate. <coughs> <coughs> okay. I would like to make uh, one comment, too, um, just so that everybody here knows. Um, at tomorrow night's work session, City Commission work session, there is an agenda item in r relations to the CIC bylaws. The City Commission is going to be determining if they would like to have um, the changes come before them. Most of our other boards and commissions, any um, bylaws or any bylaw revisions do get final approval through the City Commission. So I just wanted you to be aware of that as well. And Katie, won't they have to amend <coughs> the current bylaws or the current rules when they set up the CIC in order to make that mandatory? What current rules? Well, I have a copy of, let's see if I can find it here. Policy for the CIC Council. I don't know if, let's see, this was established by the City Commission in December of 1977. <coughs> and some rules were well, set up at that the, time. Um, and then the CIC, I mean, as you know, um, went away and then it was reestablished again uh, mm -hmm. with possibly some newer up-to-date um, okay so I don't so have the I don't know that one. I don't know if you do or don't but um, that is something that the City Commission could be considering okay. tomorrow night mm -hmm. so. okay in fact there were a number as I looked over it there were a number of um, violations I, I it's not, violation is too too harsh a word a number of things we're not doing that are in this document <coughs> Uh, but by the same token, it didn't in make any mention of reviewing bylaws for approval. Okay. okay, the next item of business is our CIC Neighborhood Association budget update. This is the one that we used for mailing out our newsletters and postcards and whatever it is each one of us chooses to do at our neighborhood level. Okay, the only way I can get this on the screen is to <laughs> make all the numbers disappear. Um, so one of the uh, new agenda items and uh, what will be coming, I think it's 
quarterly. In the new bylaws, there is an item that there will be a budget update quarterly so that you will take a look at what the CIC budget and neighborhood association um, allotments are. The way, okay, so this year was our first year doing a biannual, biannual budget. So it's um, 2013 to 2015 um, fiscal year. So it starts uh, July 1st of 2013 and goes till June 30th of 2015. Um, what was budgeted for the CIC and Neighborhood Association was I believe 51,000 and separating that into two years is 25,500. Um, taking that 25,500 and trying to separate it out to each of the neighborhoods with a somewhat equal equ equation, um, we took the number of households at the time in each neighborhood association and um, separate er, and divided it by the uh, <coughs> 25,500 and it came out to be, well we did the total population and then, or the total households and then it came out to be where it would be a dollar 72 or roughly a dollar 72 per household. So if you take a dollar 72 per household times the number of households in your neighborhood association, then that is your total budget for one fiscal year, meaning the July 2013 to June 2014. Um, and I only did, um, I'm only keeping track of it on an annual basis just because I think it would be easier for me personally to keep track of it and for you also to try to um, regulate or, or keep your amount of money and funds in kind of check for <laughs> the amount of time that we have to use them. Um, but know that something new with having a biannual budget is at the end of this fiscal year, your money does not, whatever's not being, or doesn't get used does not go back into the general fund. It's, it's rolled over to the next fiscal year because technically we don't, it's not okay. the end of our budget year. So I know there were some things like at the end of last fiscal year, there were some neighborhood associations who hadn't used all of their funds and it would have been nice to have that money roll over to this fiscal year. But since we weren't on a biennial budget at the time, we couldn't do that. And so that money goes away and we start over again with just the flat amount that you're allocated. Um, so this will actually be kind of nice for the, a couple of the neighborhoods who maybe they only meet quarterly and they only send out <coughs> quarterly um, newsletters or, or postcards or something and then they needed maybe new neighborhood association signs or something. And so um, some of the extra money that they might have had left over in their um, allotted amount, it could roll over and they could save that up to buy a new neighborhood association sign or something. Um, this is where we are at currently as far as um, there's st some that are pending right now. So uh, for example, Caulfield just sent in a postcard. Um, I haven't gotten a uh, Rivercrest just sent in a postcard. Um, so I haven't gotten bills for either one of those yet. And then uh, I feel like there's one more. Gaffney will be tomorrow. Okay. So. And McLaughlin, I thought we'd spent some of our money. You haven't. We haven't. No, remember, that's the one that, and that's another point that I would but like I to. I thought there was one coming around. Mm, yeah. No? <clears throat> okay. Pardon me. We missed the deadline. So that's the other thing I want to bring up is um, with this fiscal year, um, we changed uh, printing companies. And with the change of the printing companies comes a little bit longer, um, I guess I should say lag time between the time that you get me the postcard and the time it gets mailed out and the time that the um, citizens receive it. So I need to have the postcard and I'm, I know I mentioned this originally, but I want to mention it again because we seem to be having a little bit of problem of missing the deadlines to get those postcards out and then people are getting upset as to, well, why can't the postcard get out? Because if you could pay for it, but it's not going to get out before your meeting and therefore then you're just going to be sending a postcard that is going to be useless and spending all that money. So um, if you want it to hit the mailboxes a certain date, take that date and go two weeks back 
I need that postcard no later. That's the drop dead date, really, to get me that postcard information. Um, two weeks from the date you want it to hit the mailboxes. And the reason is, is because apparently with the bulk mailing and stuff, um, it takes anywhere from, I think it's like three to seven business days. So they can't guarantee us a certain amount of time. So it could be, you know, five or seven days before that gets out. It, mail just mail wise let alone the actual you know printing it and and that time and then my time to review it and then send it over so I mean that's why we need the two weeks for sure um, so we've had a little bit of a problem with that this year so I know there's been some people who have um, missed sending out a postcard or maybe haven't spent some of their um, funds yet because the deadline that passed and they didn't get it out um, then I also want to make another note that I was just informed um, at the very end of September, I, I can get the exact date, but I don't have it right now. Um, it was with Park Place's newsletter was the very first time I was informed of it. Um, and then South End sent a newsletter right after that. So um, with any of the newsletters on the cost sheet that I sent around, I highlighted um, an additional five cents for extra tabs. Apparently, after we had gone out for um, the RFPs for getting quotes for our printing companies, um, the um, US Postal Service changed their um, requirements for how many tabs are required on um, newsletters. And instead of them requiring just one tab at the top of the newsletter to close it, they now require two tabs. And so um, the printing company that we go with <coughs> charges five cents per tab per piece. So um, that's an additional five cents. So as far as I know, so far, the only neighborhood associations this year who have sent out newsletters or who plan to send out newsletters, and I could be wrong on this, are Park Place and South End. Um, it just so happened that um, I didn't find this out until they had already submitted their orders for the Neighborhood Association um, newsletters to go out and had already figured out how much they're going to use for their entire budget and uh, what they're going to do. And I know that because I sat down with Bob and we looked at how much money he had, what mailings he's going to do, and then, you know, for the entire year. And so I felt like this being a last minute cost I hadn't been able to notify you guys yet I needed to take that money out of the other the cushion area and not charge it to his particular neighborhood association account um, so you'll see under the other column on the actual um, spreadsheet that there is for September a fifty seven dollars and fifteen cents and then for uh, October there's a seventy one dollars and ninety cents that's for those additional tabs for um, the Park Place and the South End uh, newsletters. Um, but I'm telling you now, and I will also send out an email tomorrow, <laughs> that <laughs> any new newsletters that go out, note that the new cost, I have added it in here, and it's listed here. So the new cost will be with this additional five cents and that you'll need to figure that in for future mailings. And I'll send that out by email too, so those folks who aren't here tonight, they will get it in writing that I've notified you. So I won't be taking any additional out of the other cushion section. So does the bottom spreadsheet where you figured out how much it would cost us to send it, that includes the five cents too? Yes. Okay. Um, and then I want you to also note that um, there, the, original numbers that we pulled for the households are what's on the spreadsheet with all of the dollar amounts and what's been taken out of your accounts the numbers for the households on the cost sheet are just slightly different for some of the neighborhood associations and i'm kind of attributing that to the fact that each time you go to do a mailing the printing company pulls the new um, labels and numbers and so that could change throughout the year it's usually only one or two household numbers it's not a huge significant difference but know that that could be a possibility and you can look at the numbers now they've changed just very very slightly I want to say uh, well Caulfield uh, was 1700 and now it's 1701 so um, that will change your cost as well so you need to make sure that you are 
budgeting wisely so that you're not um, doing it right to the very dime or penny that you have in your um, allotted amount. Um, I think that's it for me. Oh, one other thing. So there was uh, a comment that came up that we had talked about doing the large map for your, um, when you go to the farmer's market or you go to the national night out or the safety fair, you have this uh, large map that we've printed. And I mentioned um, before that if I take that to get it laminated, it's like $50. And I thought that was kind of expensive. Um, so I didn't necessarily think that we needed to do that. But um, we do have the cushion that we could take the $50 out of but I also want to caution you that I try not to use that cushion because literally it's the cushion for everyone and for me. So if I make a mistake, that's my cushion. And it's a very, very small amount for the whole two years. So um, I would suggest not trying to um, just make um, purchases out of that or trying to automatically use the money out of that um, <coughs> at the beginning of the fiscal year, <laughs> but maybe wait till the end so we know how much money is kind of left over and... Well, hmm. clarification then, Katie, uh, the $513.78 is half of the total right. because it's two years. Right. And that would roll over into next year yes. again. Yes. And then um, what happens at the end of the two years if we have extra money? Then it goes away. Goes back to the general uh, fund. Then we, then we, but since we're looking at we it quarterly, we can give it to the other neighborhoods if <laughs> right. they need it. You know, right. We have that option. Well, is the map hard to? Is, is it expensive to print? Is, would fifty dollars be good insurance for it, or would it, or could we just print another map? I honestly don't know what the cost is to. Do you know, John, at all? What the cost? I don't get a lot of stuff printed. G GIS printed the map for me, so it's out of the printer down here, the color and the larger paper. Um, do you know what the cost is to print just a colored map like that? Single map. Yeah, in turn, it's the, the neighborhood association map. It's got lots of color on it. I do I know. Not insignificant, but it's not. Regular. It's probably not fifty dollars worth. Yeah. Well, we <clears throat> did um, find the person that had the old map, which oh, is not cool. current anymore. But oh. we've only got one farmers market left this year, yeah. and I would suggest we wait. The, I'll ask Faith what condition the one that's not laminated is in. Is it pretty rough? Yeah. Okay, it's so we would probably have to have a reprint and, and then a laminate. Yeah. And in okay. the rain and the wind, it was yeah. nice to oh, have the laminating. Well, laminating, yeah. mm -hmm. laminating is quite a bit. Well, they said it's $50 to laminate 50. it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so okay. I'm, we're just yeah. trying to get at the full price to get a new map that's laminated. Yeah. yeah. So we can get you a new map. Okay. Well, but it's but it, not, it's but not, it's not right. laminated. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I could print you a new map for this farmer's market and then. Um, at the beginning of next summer, like in May uh -huh. or, or whenever you guys decide January, to do this again, April, is when April or something, mm -hmm. maybe we could look at reprinting or, or either using that one, which I'm sure will probably be thrashed by them, but printing a new one and then possibly getting it laminated then. Uh -huh. Because we'll know so that we'll be almost at the end of this one year <laughs> right. and we'll see how much money is kind of in our, you know, cushion and in our accounts and stuff. Well, and actually... In some areas, because off of Peace Road and McCord, they've got a lot of new homes that have just sold. And the map should be really more updated, because I'm assuming those aren't on the site to, you know, to have it printed up yet. It's a, it's not a, it's not that specific. It's pretty general. Have you seen okay. the map? It's by road. It's, yeah. It's by road. road. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. But at, but the same token for the for the mailing, it's going to change because there's yes. a lot of homes there in that one area. Yes. I don't yes. know if that's Tower Vista or Caulfield. I don't remember, but yes. there are a lot of homes. And that will change. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. And thank you. You're welcome. You, yes, you did uh, a great job at adding that at the last minute. I hope I wasn't too late. Oh no no, no you time. weren't you weren't. Well. I wanted to accommodate them because I figure they want they need to do it now, not in January, because they want to move forward with their projects. So thank Absolutely. you. She fixed and added to our um, postcard. We have 
Now we have three people on our agenda instead of just one, so it's going to be a oh, long okay, night. Oh, okay, last yeah. minute change. Y yeah, That's so she good. added and did an excellent job. Yeah, she's, she's a wonder woman. Um, as somebody who's done the farmer's markets and a few other things with that map, um, I agree just use a paper one, get, get through this. But the other thing that the lamination adds is stiffness. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, wind resistance rain resistance nothing's worse than having your colors running down the map while you're trying to talk to somebody and, and when they put um, their fingers on it yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you know we've it's got we've got until april yeah. to look at it's whether we laminate it or whether we get on a backboard like yeah <laughs> some sort of a backboard with an acetate cover or yeah. something like that that, that we can you just, can put it down you know but so but definitely i would say we we need to plan on some sort of extra expense for the map display system okay, and, I agree. and whether it's everybody just takes you know three dollars out of their thing and covers the 50 bucks or you know whatever the case may be rather than out of the the, the cushion um, but it's it's an it's it's a cheap investment for the the boom we get from it all so mm -hmm. and the idea that I have about the map is uh, instead of the, um, the laminate works as well, but uh, sometimes the laminate can peel and you know separate. Uh, we have this company that we've used uh, in real estate, Bear Printing, and they can make actually it's like um, about as thick as a cardboard, but it, uh, you can put whatever picture you want to put on it. And it's rain resistant, it stands up to the sun. That's how we use for the Parma flyers. Mm -hmm. So that way, if you have it on a house for sale, you don't have to worry about putting in those flyers in the box. So that could be a good idea. They, they have very reasonable is. rates as well. So okay. And it's very lightweight. You can carry it around anywhere. So yeah, the one that advantage cost. of laminated is you can roll um, it. Yeah. For the, um, I think for about 15 by 17 flyers, they cost, they're charging about uh, $20, $25 for that. So. For something big, you know, we could always get a good rate for it if it's for collecting neighborhood stuff. So, yeah. Okay. Well, the value of thank you, Katie. I have one. Oh, oh I'm sorry, Bob. Go ahead. Um, on this second page of the cost sheet, uh, if you imaginatively use your budget, every neighborhood could probably have a newsletter of some kind. I found that true with Park Place. I've heard in the past that people have been complaining about the small amount of money you have for your mailings, but there is truly room in there. The last one we did, we had one, two, three full eight and a half by 11 pages that we had available to put all kinds of stuff in. So you're not limited just to those postcards that are listed here. This will give you lots of options. And that's, that's Anytime you need help with that stuff or you want to go through some scenarios, I mean, I sat down with Bob, too, or we looked at, you know, what other neighborhoods have done. I have all, I save all the old ones and stuff. Um, anytime you want to do that, just let me know. I'd be more than happy to help with anything. Bob, is that the one where you have the 57608 expense? Yes. See, in Park Place, we only have three general meetings a year. So I only have to put out three newsletters. Now, some neighborhoods obviously have more general meetings. So per meeting, you're reduced in the amount you can spend. Right. But I think some but maybe once may a be year shorting, you may be shorting right. your neighborhood by just using postcards. Mm -hmm. OK. Any other questions mm -hmm. from the members? Okay, thank you, Katie, for updating this for us. Now, next we have the item that was added, as I mentioned earlier. Jim Nasita is here with us tonight, and he wanted to bring an item before the membership. He is going to take three minutes to describe what he would like to make us aware of. <coughs> Thank you, Chair Watts. Mm -hmm. I'm James Nasita. I'm a McLaughlin neighborhood resident. And um, <coughs> well, sorry, do you want to wait just a second? So sure. <laughs> okay, go ahead. The light is on. I assume. Um, I um, just 
uh, I'm going through an experience with the city right now regarding public records. Um, I've made a Public Records Act request, and I've been um, asked for a 200 to $300 deposit to uh, process my Public Records Act request. Um, I have a fairly long history in public records advocacy and in Freedom of Information Act litigation, so I, 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 I do have uh, this, um, some experience in how the whole system of public and open government uh, laws work, um, and high and unaffordable demands for deposits are a kind of standard way of inhibiting uh, citizen access to public records. Um, this individual request aside, though, um, this has gotten me thinking about um, a lot of public records and open government issues, um, both as a private citizen and um, on my, in my own three years' experience on the City Commission. And what I've um, been mulling over uh, since I began working on this project is um, I wanted to propose to this um, the CIC a presentation. Um, uh, I'd like to present um, uh, if the CIC is interested, a uh, presentation on Public Records Act issues as they relate to Oregon City, because I think we have some pretty serious issues in this city as far as citizen access to um, uh, public information. And I think they're, they're not, they're, they're, they're kind of like policy and systemic and, and structural issues. And what I'd like to do is prevent, like, present, like, five case studies, both outside and inside of government, because I've sat in on executive sessions, um, you know, as a commissioner. I know how the system works. Um, and what I'd like to do with, if you're interested, is with each case study, present the issue and then present what I think is a, um, um, a potential solution, a policy recommendation for change, both in our, you know, public records policies that we have on the city and what I think are necessary charter amendments um, um, to, you know, give citizens more access. And there's an important issue, too, I see, that I want to explain uh, in this presentation. The issue is not only public information access of ci private citizens to inform city information and public records. There's a very important issue of um, information disclosure for by staff to the city commission and to individual commissioners okay, that I think needs to be reviewed. You're running low on time, Jim. Can okay. you wrap it up for so, us? So um, um, if, the, if, the, if the CIC is interested, I, I would be happy to make that, you know, prepare that work on that presentation um, to get a discussion going on, on these issues. Um, I know Damon actually uh, has some of the experience in, in this stuff too, and I know he disagrees with me on on at least one of my points, so I think he'd be a very effective uh, devil's advocate to the presentation I plan. If the CIC is interested, interested how, how long of a presentation are you anticipating? To really get a good discussion, not only a presentation, but a discussion, I, I think it would, I'd, I'd, li I'd like to see 45 minutes to an hour. <laughs> but I'll do whatever the you know. That's a big the, gulp to I, me. I'll do we, I'll do whatever the you we're know, always the, challenged the to get our business done in yeah. two hours, and so uh, it's hard to give up that much time and get the rest of our work sure. done. Whatever, whatever is your pleasure. Yeah. Are there any comments from the members, Paul? Uh, I, I think this is important. Well, any of us that have had uh, a desire to have an open government and 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 and, uh, and have an effective interchange. Uh, uh, this is the type of information that will make us all more effective. Uh, we need to, any of us that care about democracy, this is, this is just kind of like democracy 101. How, do we, how can we be effective <coughs> and honest about what we're doing? And anything that will enlighten us and make us better and stronger and make the system work better and stronger, I think is a step forward. I, I would endorse it. Okay, Kathy? I agree with um, Paul. Not only that, is if maybe in getting prepared for the presentation, if you could um, have all your bullet points or and maybe hand something out so that they could read it afterwards. You know, if it's not, you know. Sure. That's it, fine. Yeah, I, that I think. That. Yeah, because many times I feel that citizens aren't, um, they're disengaged with this community because of 
hard to get their answers. Uh, or they make them go through too many hoops. And if you're really working for the people, you shouldn't be doing that. So I'd be interested in it. Bob? I'd be interested in it. However, I do have one concern, is that you mentioned you would also provide a solution. And I'd be a little concerned about one person's only solution, a biased viewpoint. Uh, I would rather have two solutions, at the, at the very least, if not also somebody else's solution. I welcome that as well. I might propose that you put some kind of a draft together, maybe an outline to pre in writing that you could present to us, and then we could try to figure out when we would be able to put you on the agenda so that you could have adequate time to talk about it. Now, tonight we only had one presenter, so we've been pretty uh, fortunate to be able to be getting almost concluding our meeting on time, but that's not the norm. So we'd want to allow you enough time that you feel is sufficient, but we have to have it in a meeting when we know we don't have other pressing Chair issues. Chair Watts, would this be to a steering committee, or would it would that how? would that would be advisable? However, I would like to have the entire membership see what your doc what your outline is, so, and some points, so that they could be getting their formulating their ideas. So that when you came, we could get right to the right to the <coughs> crux of the issues. Be happy to do that. Okay. Well, and actually, whatever he does, he could actually email them to all of us, so that we have time before mm -hmm. to. That's what I'm suggesting. Yeah, so that we definitely. could digest some of your ideas before we get here, so it's not all new to us when you're presenting. Alice. Damon. Um. I hate to do this, but I kind of agree with you. No, um, <laughs> no. Um, I, I think uh, a couple of things as a guideline for your discussion. I think if you planned on 20 minutes of talking and 20 minutes of discussion, so that because you know, we all know it runs over a little bit. But if you if you shoot for that, you know, you, we've done enough public speaking that we know if you plan on 20, you know, then maybe <laughs> you'll actually make it. Um, and then also in relying in alignment with what Bob said. If you have any of these solutions, I would really like to have examples of municipalities that have adopted those. Um, because you know Oregon City's first, unless it's something new. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm not quite sure how we can do that, but we do that. Um, so, you know, of, of similar sized municipalities that, you know, have the same sort of disclosure things, um, that's that settles people down a lot more to know that oh well you know they do this in you know Reading and they do this in you know Vancouver and you know that sort of stuff so um, and I'm, I'm sure you probably have those I mean you wouldn't I doubt you, you know, well I'm not that's not the right way to say it because you're smart enough to come up with some of these on your own but mm -hmm. my you know most of these wheels have already been invented and the more places you can point to that say wheel 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 it goes over better but yeah, the idea that uh, you can get a rough outline um, to Alice, who can talk with them, uh, you know, the, the the board to say, okay, based on what we've got coming, it's going to look like March before we can have this discussion, so that we can give you the right amount of time, <coughs> because I don't want to have this be a here's everything and we're really <laughs> going in the conversation, but there's four more speakers and we just have to cut it. I'd rather we have some room mm -hmm. so Amy yeah and I just would like to make sure that it's just a very upbeat this is not I'm really concerned I don't exactly know where you're going with this suggestion and that scares me to death you know that's <laughs> kind of why I'd like to see ahead of time we're not here to pick apart anything that's not our role so I would love to hear you know I kind of before I could even say if I no, I don't have no idea where you're going with this so that that's what I would sure. agree with that's, Alice. That's the bullet points will help you with that. Yeah. Okay. And upbeat. That's what I mean. That's what I'm looking for. Okay. So what <laughs> I'm hearing from the membership is they are interested in hearing and discussing this more. And I would leave it the ball in your court to prepare something for the executive board 
that we can review and then subsequently share with the members. When do you? When does the executive board meet next? They don't you you can email it to um, mm -hmm. the executive board. She means uh, herself, and then Michael Berman and mm -hmm. Amy Wilhite. They are the um, board members of the CIC. And then just a note that Amber does have a comment too before you end this. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, pardon me, Amber. Um, yes, an email is is best. Amber, I please. I had a quick question, Jim. Just wanted to clar clarify a piece you mentioned. You had like five case studies, and you mentioned both inside and outside. I didn't catch the detail of inside and outside. Was it municipalities or business or Oregon City? Within, within Oregon City government. Within Oregon yeah. City government. Thank you. That's exactly sure. what I did. Sure. All right, then. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Committee reports. I don't see Todd here, so and I don't believe he submitted a crime prevention report. So we'll I think pass. They were uh, on hiatus over the summer, so they may not have had anything until. They did. They had a meeting September seventeenth. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if I, were you there. Yes. Yeah. Is there anything you want to share about that? Even though you're not the committee chair. Other than it was, uh, it was great to, to have the. The uh, chief's council come back together and 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 have uh, Chief Ban kind of now as the as the head man, and so we're st we'll start to see that influence of uh, his uh, uh, being the the new chief of police, and mm -hmm. some of that will start to unfold. Great. Okay. Land use. I don't think we got a report from you either. Is that because there's nothing to report? There's nothing that we. Okay. Transportation. Bob did submit a transportation report. There were two items on it, which I, I think we might have covered them both tonight yeah, John, in the Public Works John Department. Covered them well. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> no, that was the point. No, Bob <laughs> loves it. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of thought you might know. <laughs> steal your thunder. Yes, Steve. <laughs> Something I might just throw a heads up for for you and the rest of the council. I was contacted by. Uh, representatives from Walmart and apparently they have resubmitted their mm -hmm. intent to, to build their property on, uh, on Malala mm -hmm. and they were asking to talk to our our regular uh, <coughs> quarterly meeting uh, which we already had a full agenda so we tossed it back to them for their presentation so you don't have them scheduled to come to no, you? No we don't one thing you might want to note when Laura, was, I was asking her about that at one point in time, and you have to be careful because if you can't fit them in, then they can skip that step. Mm -hmm. uh, so no, 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 no. Not no. Total, they don't have no, to. No, no, no. no that's that's not, uncorrect. They can they, call their own meeting yes. at their convenience. That's right, at right. their cost, at their convenience. Yeah. Oh, but they have they to, have to hold, hold it. Um, they have to try to hold it within your neighborhood association, somewhere within your neighborhood association, or at a city facility. And it has to be certain days a week and certain times, oh, okay. I believe. We'd have to look at the code. It's specifically spelled out in the code. Oh, okay. Yeah, so she made it sound like, like they could have some 12, side 15. meeting. Yeah. <laughs> well, they can. It, uh, okay, so <laughs> uh, be careful there because there's certain neighborhood associations do have steering committee meetings, not full-on meetings uh, like every other month or every couple months, and they do have land use committee meetings. And so um, they could meet with the steering committee or the land use and uh, committee meeting if those folks in that neighborhood association feel that they have um, reached out or they will share the information or don't have a concern about them talking with the rest of the neighbors, um, they can submit saying that they have um, done their due diligence and fulfilled that part of the uh, land use application okay. section. So, Oh, uh, thanks, Katie. Uh, Katie, and actually, or, yeah, Katie, that's why I did, I have two land use coming up. I will report it later. But I, that's why I had Katie make room for them. And I'm taking my timer. Just like they do in city. city Is that for just a neighborhood grocery? Is that what you they're know, submitting I'm not this time? Sure exactly no. what type of store they're putting in. So, like the one on McLaughlin. Well, since we're l all looking at you, Steve, <coughs> would you like to start the <laughs> would you like to start the roundtable discussion? Is Thank there anything you. else you uh, want to share? We just had our. Uh, <laughs> general meeting of the year last week in which uh, we had <coughs> some new officers chosen 
and I believe those were written up and submitted to Katie for publication. Uh, it was a good meeting. We had a presentation from Tony Conkle, and he updated us on the uh, Willamette River uh, Heritage Project. Um, every time, every time I see that presentation, I get something new out of it. And no matter how many times I see it, so it's, it's a good thing. Um, we also had a couple of land use uh, presentations. Uh, one of them being a multi-unit complex, a four-story complex being built by the Center City Concern for uh, those persons in various stages of recovery. And this will be located in a very infamous location on the corner of Beaver Creek and Fur. It would be in the corner where Mm -hmm. Where it mm -hmm. goes down into the, the new old the Weaver property. The Weaver property, yes, yeah. the old Weaver property. So there was some very interesting discussion about that particular property. Yes. Um, we made some comments, but it, generally, it, it it passed our inspection. Um, this will house right around 40 families. No, 33 families, I believe. 40. 40? 40 families. Okay. Amber, anything new? I had more planned, but due to the time, I'll try to move quickly. Um, we are nearing the stages of completion of our newest Oregon City map. So everybody and their dogs are going to be very excited to know that that map will be out again because uh, we have been out for a long, long time. So uh, check with the office, the chamber office. Here in two weeks probably we should have fresh maps. <coughs> um, also the Oregon City Around Town magazine for the fall winter issue uh, we will be putting to bed shortly. So that will be out in early November. Um, We'd like to invite the community to the State of Our Schools luncheon, which will be our keynote speakers will be both President Truesdell from the Clackamas Community College and uh, Larry Didway, Superintendent of Oregon City uh, School District. That will be Tuesday, November 26th at Clackamas Community College Gregory Forum, 11.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. And uh, our business community knows how important business and education is. Um, business has got to have an educated and prepared workforce and education relies on a strong property tax base uh, income tax base to make that all happen for them so um, we encourage the community to be in tune with that uh, we also had a fantastic first ever Oregon City Biz, uh, Biz Fair Harvest Fest this last Saturday it was a lot of fun and I brought programs just in case you want to see what we were doing Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Tony? Hi, uh, nothing much is going on with Berkeley Hills right now. We have our meeting scheduled for uh, end of the uh, quarterly meeting scheduled for tomorrow at 7 o'clock. So um, the last meeting was a success. It went very well for the most part. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> Any fees discussion you're going to have, Tony? No, no, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm not expecting this one to be as. Um, as eventful as the last one, but uh, <laughs> hopefully we'll have some neighborhood supporters that will show up and get things done. So, yeah. Okay. Damon McLaughlin. Um, we're in a steering committee month. Um, there's a, a one thing I'd mention, like Steve did, is keep your eye on what's going on with the heritage uh, area. It. It moves really slow, and then suddenly lots of stuff happened, and then it moves really slow. So just because you looked at it yesterday doesn't mean that you're up to date. Um, we're, uh, the neighborhood is having a meeting with the library um, to look at, um, it's, I can't remember the date, Sunday, um, to uh, go over what the interior of a new library would look like. It's, they're not, you know, because the, the current plan, current quotes, plan is to
to uh, basically add on to the Carnegie, uh, basically into the hillside, um, and you know what that'll look like and all that. That's a whole nother different fight. Um, but what Marine would like to know is if they're able to put a three-story facility together of such and such dimension, what would be the interior? Um, you know. What's the reading room look, you know, looking like? Where would computers? How many? You know that sort of stuff. It's just literally a touchstone of this is what we kind of like to do. Does it make sense? Kind of a thing. Uh, and she's <laughs> meeting with us in the McGough neighborhood because she's there. Mm -hmm. um, Going to plan a parking structure underneath one. Uh, no. And unfortunately, there's no more uh, theaters in the area to tear down to turn into parking lots either, but, <laughs> which is the other trick. They, when they tore down the stage for parking, hmm? they acquired some land. Okay. Um, and there was something other really important, and I don't remember. Oh, we um, over the Willamette Falls is do is moving in uh, a teen treatment care facility over the top of the uh, emergency room and it's a secure facility um, we were supposed to have a tour of it but they got a little behind on their their construction they didn't want us walking around while they're moving giant air conditioning units over the roof but uh, it's gonna basically add 50 more jobs to that facility um, and really not be much of an impact to the neighborhood so it's just you know just basically a plus to to the area I've got to say the chamber had a chance to tour it mm -hmm. it is a fantastic facility yeah. top of the line nice Great. I'm excited to see yeah. it Barbara do you want to share yeah. anything um, I would just like to share that in the Park Place neighborhood we have Holcomb School and they put in a new playground there uh, and had the opening at their open house in late August and many of the residents of um, Park Place, several re residents, not many, <laughs> um, helped build that um, play, the new playground uh, equipment. So uh, they had an open house, and we had a table there, and, and you know, talked to neighbors as they came and heard a lot of stuff, you know, but it was very interesting. Uh, they had refreshments there for purchase and a cake and. Was a, it was a nice celebration of their new playground and neighborhood activity. Great. Great. Paul, Kanima? Um, not a lot going on so much with Kanima, but I would like to make a comment as a Urban Renewal Commissioner that we had a presentation at the last Urban Renewal meeting of uh, somebody that's about to resurrect what was the rivers and they made a presentation that was extremely positive and uh, it could be significant in that uh, they're talking ab about uh, 600,000 square feet of retail. Uh, they've uh, uh, solved the problems with the driving range and have a signed agreement in hand uh, with Scott Parker and most who Scott Parker owns the property with his family so most of those ducks now are in a row so uh, there is a high probability that uh, something will be moving at these people own uh, lot, lots of different shopping centers or centers of significance uh, uh, a third of what they've bought or they have bought two-thirds they have developed and they they try to create a theme associated with each of their centers and it uh, uh, they own uh, Kaiser Center that was developed actually by someone else but they have uh, they're very big down in what they call the Gold Coast of California where they have a lot of uh, uh, major commercial real estate places but what's the key to all of this is that they come to get come to us with a whole portfolio of relationships with major entities uh, that come in so 
there's a high probability that they could be very successful and bring a lot of new blood and businesses and people. They're saying they could bring about a thousand new jobs to Oregon City, permanent jobs to Oregon City, most of which are retail at all different phases or classes going up and down the spectrum uh, in that range between a thousand and, and uh, uh, and 1400 but that's uh, it sounded good uh, and I would uh, they made a very first-class presentation and uh, uh, I thought that most everyone uh, was pleased that uh, heard the presentation I would also like to, to say that I uh, had the opportunity of the in fact an honor to um, kind of represent Oregon City in the uh, Clackamas River uh, Lower Clackamas River Watershed Council or Watershed Tour. And it was hosted by Clackamas River Water Providers, and it, I spent a day uh, going up and down the Clackamas River, learning how where all of our water comes from and how every one of the companies are kind of working together now entities to make sure that we have a reliable water resources for Oregon City as well as for everyone else that's drawing water from the Clackamas River. And some of the most exciting parts of it was the opportunity to understand how PGE, which made major presentations to us, they have the dams. But the dams are one thing, and another thing is, in Oregon, is fisheries. And those, those salmon have to get up above the dam so they went through and explained everything that they're doing including taking us into a place where virtually no one gets to go into and this was a a, a salmon uh, uh, counting sorting center where every salmon steelhead uh, bull trout or any major thing that comes up the fish ladders and how they they by the way they've changed it all uh, how they collect the, the fry and get them down through the river but this one thing where you saw these Paul, how's our time big fish <laughs> and it was fun it was to see it and we're in good hands because they're doing it right thank you Brian okay uh, we don't have a uh, haven't had a meeting since our last meeting here but uh, we will be getting uh, an agenda in real soon uh, on a s slightly separate issue I did uh, two weeks ago find a rare plant in Waterboard Park Ooh. there's actually one of them there it's only been found in five areas in the Portland area so interesting discovery you dug it up and put it in a pot and <laughs> <laughs> well I, it's, it the plant is actually on the endangered list in New York because of collectors oh. so oh, okay. yeah it's a pretty plant <laughs> Kathy That's please we have a meeting October 17th at the church on South End Road by the fire station. Can you turn your mic on? Oh. We have our meeting October 17th at 7 o'clock at the church next to the fire station. Tom O'Brien was at work hard. We have a little article and pictures of the Girl Scouts that worked in our park. And it says that they, uh, the goal was to remove 50 wheelbarrow loads of all this other <coughs> this stuff that's on the ground to make it easier for the park people to um, to mow it. So and that was done August 10th. And um, we're going to have, we have three presentations. I think it's the Willamette Legacy is coming, if I'm not right. And then we have... Um, which is going to be controversial, and AT&T proposes to discuss its facility as a tree located behind the school of John McLaughlin. To put a tower up. Yeah. There's already people asking, emitting radiation, you're putting this in a school grounds where they play in the grounds and stuff, and people walk around and everything. So gotcha. it will be interesting. And then we have <laughs> um, on Central Point and... Hazel Grove and Skillinger Way around Wheeler's Tree Farm. They have 17.74 acres and they want to change the zone from R10 to R6 and put 113 homes and they're coming to our. Wow, that's meeting. quite a meeting. 
Yeah. Wow. It's gonna, okay. You think this is long. Yeah. <laughs> so. Mike? Um, I think pass. Okay. Thank you. Amy. <laughs> Are you skipping yourself? I am skipping okay. myself. Um, we have our Gaffney Lane meeting on the 24th. And, um, yeah, I forgot what I was going to say about that. But one thing I did, I went to the homecoming parade, and I thought just throwing it out there, either the homecoming parade, the teddy bear parade, I thought we should put together a float. I think It doesn't have to be something fancy, mm -hmm. but I just thought, you know, if we're trying to be out there for the city, what a great thing that that would be. Just, I'm sure we could, somebody has something we could drive and throw candy in or, or whatever. <laughs> throw flyer, you throw know, maps. Know. You know, yeah, throw maps. <laughs> I just thought we, you know, if we're all about going out to the city, that, those would be, that would be something great that we could positively get out there like we're trying to do at the market. I think that would be fun as it comes around again. Maybe I'll remember and With propose that. The and teddy bear parade is fun. Phyllis yeah. Docking has done it. I just thought that that would be a great thing. Yeah. And nobody mentioned, I was surprised, my mom went on Sunday to a, with a tree heritage tour or something. They got on a bus and drove around and they dedicated a sculpture down at um, Clackamas Park that I hear is beautiful. I, I was surprised that didn't come up at somebody that's in that na those neighborhoods. But um, for as far as Gaffney Lane goes, I know it's part of Hillendale, but I'll sure be glad when the Claremont paving is done because they keep changing which road is closed <laughs> we do have the, we do have the police coming and I just drive around the barrier we have the police coming to talk to us there's a neighbor there's a house in our neighborhood that's had quite a few SWAT raids and flash bombs going off and um, I guess in that area they know all about it and so we'll, they'll be talking about that at the meeting and any other questions that people have for the police, that, that's a great thing to have. If you're not using your liaisons, I would really encourage you to, to talk with them. Um, and so we have a couple other agenda items I don't remember exactly, but. Okay. Thank oh, you. and also the next door neighbor, I know some of you guys are using that website. <coughs> they allow you to send free postcards. And um, so I was amazed just through the postcards, how many people in the neighborhood have join that it'll be interesting to see if that affects our attendance um, but next door neighbor it's a free program that you can use and then you can post information and so anytime we get emails from the city I've been putting that on there and then I, I get feedback and so it's a really I think it's a really great tool that we can be using to keep members that can't always come to the meeting that are online that they can be involved and give us comments and feedback well could you send that to, pee, to us because I don't know oh, sure. what it is. Oh, sure. I can email that out. Okay. You, you want to send it to everybody? Yeah. Okay. Thank is you. Is it just like a software? Like it's Facebook called, yeah. Hands, no, so like a next door neighbor. So it's like a social board. It's kind of like a social media. It's, yeah, it's like Facebook. Yeah. And it's got the, it has the boundaries of your neighborhood and you can. Yeah. Only the people within the neighborhood can access that yeah. neighborhood, particular neighborhood website. So it's, the website is created for each neighborhood itself. So if your, your if your address is in a different borderline on the other one, it won't even let you get in. Mm -hmm. So okay. when you register, it sends you a postcard, and you get the code and go onto the website, put in the code for your particular house, and then it connects you. Oh, yeah. That's so it makes sure. Or you can do it online, outside. like the yeah. can call you. Or you already got that going in Kanima, yeah. don't you? It, it's been difficult trying to get everybody to do it because there's a certain fear. Mm -hmm. That uh, that they're giving up some information or mm. into the into the big stratosphere of of, uh, of the web, and so yeah, it's just another tool for. A and it's just a tool. Board, it's a bulletin a board that allows us to uh, to talk to neighbor to neighbor, and uh, I would great. love to see it work better than than <coughs> it has been. It's been difficult to kind of get it. Uh, going and I've had to go out and really just knock on doors and pull up. Hey, would you kind of please sign have up? You ha have you done the, the mailing of the free new, the free postcards that they will mail for you? No. You should check. You Put should in the them. names and the addresses of your neighbors. You can do a couple yeah. months worth of a hundred each and then the Okay. 40. Okay. Yeah. You guys want to talk after I'll Bob? Email. It's your turn. Okay. Well, we have one of those going in Park Place too. In fact, I have just about completed my rounds of going to all those neighbors, inviting them special invitation to our next general meeting which is October 21st <coughs> hopefully we'll get some of those this Saturday Park Place is having its first annual Halloween Bazaar 
at Holcomb and Longview in the Red Community Building. And of course, the first year you never know. We've got some vendors signed up now, and we'll see what happens. What day and time is that again? Next Saturday. The 19th nine, or the 12th? Nine to four. The 12th? The 12th. Nine to four. From nine to four. Okay. Um, we have four developer, developers in Park Place alone that are looking to build and in my conversations with the planning department they said that they're just going crazy up there mm -hmm. a few years ago they had to lay off people because of the economy and now the people that are left are just they're uh, they're just going crazy so hopefully this shows that maybe the, the Oregon City economy will start coming up a little bit um, that's all I have <coughs> John, anything more? Yeah, there was a couple. No, well, I'll just go over one of them because one of them's got legs to it. And I don't, I don't want to waste your time with that. But uh, I forgot to mention that the um, Oregon Passenger Rail, which is a rail proposal between Eugene and really the Oregon border, um, and with envisioning beyond. But anyway, that's it's a kind of a long-term planning process. There's been a variety of meetings associated with that, and public open houses. Some have been here in Oregon City. There's one scheduled for November 12th um, at the Pioneer Community Center from 4 to 6.30 p.m. It seems like that conflicts with our, uh, slightly conflicts with our city commission meeting. But um, but anyway, but the uh, both, I've been attending some of these meetings and the mayor has as well, but they're, gonna, they're narrowing their search to a few routes couple of which come through Oregon City so there would be an impact and would be a point of interest for I would think this group in particular so feel free to go there and see what they're talking about That's it. Katie okay, I do have uh, two items first item is um, I'm glad that Amy brought up about the um, police department liaisons I hadn't heard a lot of feedback about that but I know that a lot of people have had their have had time now to have their liaison come and introduce themselves and be a part of at least one meeting if not more um, the only uh, thing that I have heard a recommendation that the city would like to ask of you is that if you could at all possible try to get them at the beginning of your meeting mm -hmm. um, it's really hard for them to stay through the entire meeting waiting for um, the end to where they have to speak and then also do their duties as being called out on the road and stuff so some are, are, are waiting around and then getting called out and not being able to <laughs> actually speak and then some are waiting through the whole thing and then speaking at the end and then and then going the other you know police officers are going where have you been <laughs> so it would be um, very uh, appreciate appreciative if you could uh, put them at the beginning of your meeting and then um, just uh, I know you all received this, but just a reminder that the Willamette Falls Legacy uh, Project Interactive event is this Thursday, October 10th, from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. at the Museum of the Oregon Territory uh, Tumwater Room. And if you uh, don't already know the website, it's www.rediscoverthefalls.com. So you can always find up-to-date information on that. That's it. Is there a link on the city's website for that? Yeah. There is, uh, yes. <laughs> She's the spokesman. Okay, <laughs> Diane, would you like to report for uh, Rivercrest? Sure, you bet. We're having our um, neighborhood association meeting, general membership meeting, October 17th at 7 o'clock. And after you have the speaker for the legacy, <laughs> for all, they're coming over to our meeting. Uh, we also have um, election. election of officers, new officers. Um, so that should take up most of the meeting, hopefully. Oh, we do have two problem houses in our neighborhood, and the police department is, um, well, one of them's the, um, we've had problems with six or seven years ago, and it's um, a strange situation. Land, well, the land, the owners of the property don't live in Oregon City, and they're letting a family member live in the house, and the family member has just Trashed it. Trashed it. Besides that, um, a lot of different people have been in and out and living there and not living there and just problems. It's a just a trashy mess. They have been, the, the code enforcement's 
been really active in documenting things and they've given them a summons now I think I haven't heard when they're to appear, appear in court but hope they've since cleaned up pretty much cleaned it up but it's it's an ongoing problem and the code enforcement has done a bang up job keeping on them and taking care of it that other house is kind of a drug related problem and I I think that the police department will will do everything they can to um, alleviate it, the neighbors of the problem that it, it's just traffic all the time day and night every two or three minutes a car comes and leaves and um, I remember another problem we had in uh, uh, several years back the the um, there was an order you were probably on the, it was on Valley View and they t the, the city was able to uh, I'm not sure how they it was an ordinance of some obviously some kind but they took the property away or made the property owner sell it do you remember that it was under the nuisance ordinance but that's it. Um, they also did things like the police officers just parked in front of it while they wrote their reports for the night. And <laughs> yeah, that's where, you know, it's, yeah, it's that's kind of what they're doing now here. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. it, by, by the time we got around to the nuisance, they were already ready to find a reason to get out of there. And that was well, hopefully that will that will um, occur in our neighborhood. Good suggestion. But it, it's a, it's just a mess. It's. Um, but they're working on it, and, I, and the more, and you know what really upsets me is everybody calls me. Well, you know, I've got this problem. If they would call either code enforcement or the police department, the number of complaints they get is going to determine how much effort they put into the. Oh, they think you're the only one that cares. I know. <laughs> I'll do something or call somebody. No, I mean the city. Oh yeah, because you're right. constantly calling right. them. Are you providing them then with the the information of your uh, police liaison or? You betcha. Uh, good, good. <laughs> so hopefully that'll that'll be cleared up for too much longer. But um, and and they're really concerned about Big Brother watching it. I keep telling them if you complain that the police department's not going to say oh well Diane McKnight called and said <laughs> <laughs> well, it's anonymous so anyway but we're, we're getting better at more people are now starting to call either code enforcement or the police there's also the OC request that they can yeah. submit oh, yeah, anonymously, anonymously. Yeah. as well so then they don't even have to contact yeah, you they right. could just submit online and yeah, yeah. No, yeah. it's getting better thanks <laughs> thanks Diane Faith any more um, not really Steve did the report we did have our police police Good. I'm glad they're getting around. Ingra? I don't know if we've, I don't think we've reported since we had a really good meeting in August mm. with our picnic with our neighborhood association Oops. and we had, a, oh, sorry, in August we had a neighborhood meeting or picnic at Chapin Park and we had really good attendance and we had people come who I haven't seen at meetings but um, they enjoyed the hot dogs and <laughs> yeah. so good they thing. were there for a free dinner out. <laughs> oh, nice. Mary Ann. I'll just add that our next meeting is the 17th of this month and as the secretary for our um, neighborhood association I will add that we had 22 people at our meeting which was yes. for us was, yeah. <laughs> was yeah. pretty awesome. Yeah. It's pretty okay. awesome. 22. I'd be that's, happy to have That's 20. excellent. Yeah. All right our meeting is adjourned. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Yes. Yes.